All right, thanks a lot, John. My name is Graham Linetto, Alpine Director for Swix, and tonight we're going to be covering, um, going pretty deep in edge tuning. Um, so we're going to go over a laundry list of, of uh, how-tos here. So how to re read the base bevel, uh, what is base bevel, how to set base bevel, maintain base bevel. We're going to spend a lot of time on base bevel tonight. Uh, how, how the side edge bevel works, how to check side edge bevel, how to set side edge bevel, how to remove the sidewall material, how to shape skis, sharpening by hand, sharpening by machine, and then we'll get into touching up edges as well. And then finally, we're going to talk about adjusting the sharpness for the conditions. All right, before we get started, I just want to make a quick mention about PPE. The last uh, clinic that we did, we took it pretty deep, talked about all the safety requirements, but just make sure that you're wearing the proper safety equipment in the ski room. We always talked about wearing a uh, long sleeve shirt, uh, eye protection, a hat, ventilation, or a respirator, and some gloves. Tonight, just in order so you can hear me, I, I'm not going to be wearing all that, but uh, do be safe in the ski room. All right, so we're going to start out <clears throat> with base bevel. And base bevel is going to be the most important uh, aspect of ski tuning, and it's going to control how reactive your skis are. So you can have the best equipment in the world. You can have the best boots. Everything can be perfect. But if your base bevel is set improperly, your skis won't work right. It's where your skis interface with the snow. So base bevel, how it works and how to read it. So base bevel is going to control how quickly your ski will edge. So the flatter the base bevel, the quicker the ski. So too little base bevel will leave the skis feeling railed or overly aggressive, and too much base bevel will leave the skis feeling dead and damp. Once the base bevel's set, don't touch it again. It's set. So if you have a half degree or 0.75, whatever you have on your base bevel, anytime that you go in there to do a little touch up or clean it up, you're adding bevel. It's really one of the only ways that you can really destroy the performance of your skis. So stay away from touching the base bevel. And we'll get into that in some detail here. And the other thing to keep in mind is base bevel will just change over time. So before I go too far, I want to talk about specifically what is base bevel. So the diagram here shows a ski basically uh, base up. And on top there, we have a true bar. So I'm checking the flatness of the ski and then also checking the flatness of the actual edge on the base. So this diagram one shows a flat ski, flat base material, flat edges, dead flat. The next one's going to show you specifically base bevel, what it is. So with the true bar on top of the ski, that little space there is going to control how reactive your skis are. That's the base bevel. And then finally, this last diagram shows the difference between a 0 0.5, 0 0.75, 1 degree, 1.5. So as we increase that bevel, the edges get further and further away from the snow, and your skis become less reactive. So as I mentioned earlier, the ski construction is always breaking down. So what's going to happen is the base bevel naturally increases. Some skis are more stable than others. Some skis, the bevel can change pretty quickly. Some may stay stable and not change as fast. But the ski is made out of many different components held together by resins. And the resins are constantly breaking down over time, just from the ski flexing and moving. So there's a slow erosion of performance. You don't feel it happen like that. So you don't necessarily understand that things are changing underfoot. So slight adjustments or touch up in the ski room will slowly add bevel too. So if you're, if you're at a 0.5, and uh, you want to come into the ski room and just touch up that base bevel with a guide. Even though you have a half degree guide and the ski set at half degree, most of the time people like to push a little harder to get that file to bite. You're adding bevel. So you're going from a half degree, 0.75. You do it again, you're at a one degree. So your skis are becoming less and less reactive every time you do that. If you have damage on the base and you want to fix or repair that specific area, it's okay. I'd say just work on that one specific little spot. And then if you start to have a lot of areas that need more and more attention, that's when you need to take your skis to a reputable ski service shop where they can flatten with a stone grinding and reset the bevel. 
And generally speaking, throughout the season, I would say start the season with the stone grind, make sure the bevel's set correctly, and then take it to the shop midway through the season, have them put a true bar on it, and check the, tr the ba base bevel and see if it needs to be reground. It wouldn't be unusual to do this a couple times throughout the season. But there's a, a couple of good indicators that help you understand if something's changed. So if your skis are razor sharp, and you're on icy snow and they're just not holding. That's usually a pretty good indication that the base bevel is pretty strong. So like it may be closer to one degree. A really sharp ski on ice with a one degree on the base, it won't hold. If you have a half degree on ice with a, a sharp ski, it should hold nice. So that's a good indication something's changed. The other thing too, and this is big, if you start the season and the coach is looking at how you, stand in, how you stand on your skis and the canting and your boots look good, and everything is good to start the season, and then you roll in a couple months into the season and then the coaches are, are not liking the position, how far you have to get the, the boot over on edge to get the ski to bite, that's a pretty good indication that something's changed. If you didn't change anything in the setup of your boot or the bindings, the interface at the snow, the base bevel is probably increased. So that's a pretty good indication that you need to get your skis checked and reground. <clears throat> All right, so I wanted to use this slide to show you the difference in base bevel, <clears throat> specifically how much you need to angle to get the skis to bite. So a flat base bevel, or let's like say this, this skier on the left is at a half degree, you don't need to create as much angle to get that edge to purchase and start the turn. Things are going to happen faster. The skis are more aggressive. Whereas an increase of base bevel requires more angle to get to edge. So these are pretty extreme um, examples, but it just gives you an idea of how much further you need to roll the ski up on edge in order to get it to bite, hook up, and go. <clears throat> All right, so this, this slide here, I just wanted to show how you can be specific with bevel and how it works. So if you have a, a train that has a, a flat pitch, a moderate pitch, and a steep pitch, naturally you can select the bevels that are going to be fastest in those sections. I just want to kind of use this as an idea of, just to help you understand how the base bevel is working. So in timing, what I've seen, is a one degree base bevel is going to be the fastest in the flat sections. So if you have a nice flat long course section, having to ski with more bevel is going to allow the ski to drive downhill more. So it's going to be faster than a ski that's hooking up and wanting to come across the hill. When you get into moderate train, the 0.75 seems to be the fastest. It's kind of a good combination of, uh, of bevel. It, it's hooking up enough but it's also allowing the ski to drive downhill as well. The fastest bevel out of these three on the steep pitch, it's gonna be the half degree because that ski hooks up quicker, it's gonna come across the hill faster when you need to have quick reactions. So you can really dial in uh, your base bevel for specific conditions if you really wanna take it to extremes, but I would say generally speaking, find something in the middle and use that uh, just to keep it simple for you. Okay, reading base bevel. This can be really hard to do, and we're going to get into this so you guys can understand exactly how to do it. So I use this two different examples here, these different ways that you can actually read it. I've done this so much I can just do it by eye, and I can just put my true bar on the ski and roll it up and tell exactly what the base bevel is. But these digital meters help people understand these tight tolerances. So the difference between a half degree and a one degree you can't really see it with your naked eye. This is something that um, you have to really develop a, a, an eye for. You have to have a really good source of light behind you as well to help you. But these tight tolerances, to me, what, is what makes ski tuning really cool. It's not like working on a bike where you can spin the wheel and see where it's out of whack. These tight tolerances matter. And it's amazing how much of a difference the feel is on snow between these two bevels. So something to keep in mind. Okay, so reading the bevel specifically how to do it. So this guide is going to work just like my true bar. Of course, this is a lot more sophisticated. There's a light on the back side of this guide that helps you see the actual bevel 
and of course a nice digital meter that helps you read it. So what you want to do is find the light under the true bar. You put your, your true bar on the ski and we're looking at that light right there. That's the actual base bevel. Then we want to roll that up to match the base bevel angle. So I want to roll my true bar up right till I can't see any more light. That's my, that's my base bevel. So I don't read it on this side of the ski right where the, the bevel is. I'm going to read it two inches over the height of the uh, bar off the base. So two inches from the base edge is where you measure the base bevel. Just to give you an idea of what the thickness is, so a half degree is going to be basically about the thickness of a, a piece of electrical tape. So in this area, I should be able to slide a little piece of electrical tape under, matching that angle over there on the base edge, half degree. One and a half thicknesses is going to be about 0.75 and two strips of electrical tape two inches over is going to be about a one degree. It's not perfect, but it gives you a basic idea of how to read base bevel. Okay, base bevel. Start with less. So if you're unsure what kind of base bevel is going to work for you, I always tell people start with less because you can always add more. So if you start with a half degree and you don't like how it feels, you can always come back down to the ski room and add a little bevel with the file. Super easy. So what you do is slowly chip away until you find that desired performance. And how do you know what that is? So if I'm skiing on my skis and I have a half degree and I'm having a really hard time getting the skis out away from me, they feel super aggressive, that's a pretty good indication that I'm going to have to add some base bevel. And just chip away at it nice and slow. Go to the ski room and I'll show you how to do it. Um, add couple pulls of a file, get to 0.75, ski on it, try it, see how it works. It's going to be pretty, it's a pretty personal thing. Not, not all these bevels are going to work the same for everybody because everybody's boots are canted a little different. So it's going to take a little bit of work to make sure you get what's exactly right for you. So how to set the base bevel? We're going to start with a clean, flat ski. We're going to need a, the base bevel guide that we need to set the base bevel. You're going to have to have a file, a file brush to clean the, um, the file as you go. And uh, we can get started here. All right, so I'm going to start with my skis in the vise, base up. I always like to start with my tip to the left because it's kind of a consistent thing for me. I know exactly where I am if I happen to walk away from the ski and I come back, I know, oh, the tip's at my left, so I'm working on the inside edge. Just kind of a little repetition thing I like to do. So before I actually set the base bevel, you want to make sure that your ski's nice and clean, and you want to make sure your, your tools are clean too, because you don't want to scratch the base, bevel, or the base of the ski and make a mess that you have to go back and clean up again. So go ahead and take a nice, sharp plastic scraper. I'll start at the tip, and I'll just make one full pass down the ski to make sure that there's no debris in the base. And then I'll just take a little brush here. This is a fine steel brush, and I'm just going to brush it out before we actually use it the tool. Now, I don't have to go too crazy here, but I just want to make sure the ski is nice and clean. I'll just take a little shop towel, wipe the ski off. All right, now we want to make sure that our guide is clean too and burr free. And we're going to do this with all of our guides that we work with tonight. So I take a ceramic stone. There's no abrasive quality here. And I'm just going to run it around the sides and the base of this guide. So when I put it on the ski, there's not a burr that's going to scratch up my ski or make damage. The other thing, too, is if you notice how I have my tools here, everything's base up. You know, you're not leaving your tools laying face down on the table where they could scratch pick up a burr, damage your skis. So I try to make sure that everything is in a position where it's not going to damage my skis eventually. All right. So with the ski and the vise, I'm going to make sure I put my glove on here. I'm going to be working on the inside edge when I set base bevel. So I'm going to pick my guide. I'm going to put my, my file in. I'm always going to be working on that inside edge. And then when I get ready to do the other 
edge. I'm going to flip the ski around so I can keep the pressures consistent. I'm always going to be setting my bevel on the inside. So I've got my file guide here. I have it a half degree. I want to make sure I put a nice clean file in there. So I always have a card around to make sure I can clean out the, the file. Let's wipe it down like this. All right, and then we're ready to, to pull the base bevel. So I looked at this ski beforehand. These are brand new. It's, it's pretty close to a half degree, but I'm going to make sure it's consistently a half degree. So I'm going to take this guide, come all the way up to the tip. You can also see that my file is going to be pulling. I'm going to be pulling in this direction. So I have to make sure the tang or the tail of the file is in the back. Somebody told me when I was a kid, the tail always follows the dog. And that's kind of stuck with me. So remember, have that tail on the back as you pull that file towards you. All right, so we're going to go right up into the tip, hold it nice and flat. And then I'm just going to do four light pressure full length passes. <clears throat> Again, I'm not going to push to make this thing cut. If it's not cutting, it's because there's more bevel than a half degree. So let the, let the guide do its work. And I'm just going to make four passes like that. So I could feel it grabbing right underfoot there. And then the tip. And I'll just do one final pass here. So ideally, <clears throat> if the skis were brand new and I had stone ground them, that bevel would be I'd, this completely flat. And so I would just be setting a, a half degree for the full length. Most, like I said, most of the ski was at a half anyways. And there were some sections that were a little bit less, like a quarter degree. So I just tied that all together and made it uniform. All right, so I'll just take my scraper real quick scrape off any debris that came off from the filing and then I'm going to flip the ski around to do the to do the other edge think about that all right so you can see my files a little dirty I'm just going to take that brush and clear it out I'm going to make four more full length passes with moderate pressure Okay, so now I should have a half degree on my ski, but I'm going to check it. So everything that we do, we're going to double check and make sure that the angle's where we want it. So I'm doing this by hand, and I always want to make sure I have a really great source of light so I can see the bevel. And I can put my true bar on there, and I can roll it up until I can see the thickness of a one strip of electrical tape two inches over. We've got a half degree. So we're good there. All right. So how do you fix it if there's too much bevel? There's really only one way to do it. You can't do it by yourself. You have to take it to a shop to have the skis stone ground, flattened, and then have the base bevel reset. That's why I say if you're not sure, start with less because you can always add more. But if you have too much, you'll never know what a lesser bevel feels like. So start with less. OK, edge angles. So sometimes I'll talk to people about these angles, and they'll say, oh, I have a half degree on the base and a three degree on the side. So effectively, I have a, you know, they get into this like complicated situation with, the, with trying to understand the bevels. But I'd like to just think of them as two entirely separate things. Base bevel controls reaction. Side edge bevel is going to control power on edge, right? So we're looking specifically at the side edge bevel here. So side edge bevel controls how powerful the ski feels on edge. The sharper the angle, the more edge hold. The sharper angle requires, the sharper angle is less durable. So it's going to require more tuning. And, um, 
So again, people ask me all the time, I, should I be using a two degree or a three degree bevel? And I always say, how often are you tuning? So if you're skiing five days a week, but you're only tuning once a week, the two degree bevel might be a better fit for you because the ski's gonna stay sharper longer with the two degree. But if you're often if tuning your skis often, a couple of three days a week or every night that you're out skiing, you're gonna get more performance out of the three degree. So it's just something to keep in mind there. Uh, also, just, this is just a really quick graphic to show the durability versus power. All right, so you can check this. Something that you can do at home really easy. It's important to make sure that you're checking your angles and understanding your equipment. And we're gonna go pretty deep with this in the, in the fourth series. We'll go into specifically how you uh, check all these bevels and you build out a, um, a vision of, of your equipment. You understand exactly why you like something or you don't. So we're, we're building on this as we go. So you wanna make sure you have a well-lit workspace. You're gonna place the ski, your uh, side edge guide against the base of the ski. You'll place your true bar on top of the guide and walk it down to the side edge of the ski. And with the true bar and side edge guide in place, you should see no light across the actual side edge of the ski. So light showing on the binding side means that the bevel's too strong and light showing on the base side means it's too weak. So what am I talking about here? So this is uh, a graphic of the um, ski and the vices with bases away from the technician. Let me move this around real quick. And then what we have is a side edge guide and a true bar. So I take my three degree guide and my true bar. And just as I talked about there, I can place that guide right up against the base. I take my true bar, put it right on top of that guide, and I can walk it right down to the edge. And right at the edge, if I don't see any light, I have a three degree side edge be be bevel. If I see light on the base edge side, that means it's less than three degrees. And if I see light on my side, that means it's a sharper angle and it's more than a three degree. This diagram shows a little tighter detail. Um, this is going to be the four degree. Well, let me back up. If I'm setting the three degree angle, there's no light underneath the actual edge. If it's a two degree, there's going to be light showing on the base edge side. And if there's more than a three degree, there's going to be light showing on the binding edge side. Okay. So that brings us to removing sidewall material. What usually happens is it's going to be a negative angle. Like rarely would you find that, oh, I have a stronger angle than what I was anticipating. So what we need to do is uh, what happens is that the sidewall material gets in the way and the file hits the sidewall material and pulls a negative angle. So it's really important that we're removing that sidewall material on a fairly regular basis in order to make sure that we have room for our file to get in and set the right angle. So this is something I recommend probably, well, when the ski's new, you got to set it up, do the sidewall work. We're going to take this pretty detailed. But after you do that, every time you sharpen, you get a little closer and closer to the actual sidewall material. So it's going to require that you remove that sidewall material again. So the sidewall tool is going to be <clears throat> a really important tool for your at-home tuning. Okay, so this is going to be, thanks. This is going to be a little uh, detail of exactly what we're talking about. So this pair of skis is brand new. So from the factory, the sidewall material is going to look very similar to this. So there's your side edge. There's a, a little bit of sidewall material that basically matches the side edge itself, and then uh, the vertical sidewall material. The tips and tails, <clears throat> they're going to require a little bit more work. The, the, from the factory, they have a machine that goes in and sands and builds this taper into the ski, and they have to stop 
<clears throat> probably for the first eight or 12 inches and the last eight or 12 inches. So we have to do a little bit more work in that area to make sure that the side wall is removed and out of the way. So <clears throat> you can clearly see that if I try to put my file on here, it's gonna run right into that sidewall material and I'll pull a negative angle. I'll still be able to get the ski sharp. It just won't be a three degree. It'll be a two or maybe even a one degree. So we wanna remove that material. And so we're left with the ski that has a nice clean sidewall and there's room for my file to get in there and cut. So I just want to show you something really quick here. Tonight I'm going to be talking about using a round blade. There's also a square blade available. The round blades are a little bit easier to work with, especially if you're just getting started. So let's see if I can draw the side edge here. So if this is a new ski, this is the actual edge and this is the sidewall material. If I'm using this round blade, I wanna get as close as I can to that edge without actually touching it. And the round blade's really good because it gets right in there and it, it cuts that material out and I can have room for my file to do its job. But the square blade's a little tricky and <clears throat> really it's something I kind of recommend for people that are more highly skilled. And uh, the reason why is I've seen a lot of people remove that sidewall material with that square blade and they just blast all this material out of the way. And so the, the edge is totally exposed. It's really easy to set the side edge bevel. But when you sharpen this, now you've got two edges. You've got this one that's at the snow and when you're on edge, this one's hot too. And when you're on edge, it's gonna be hard to get off the ski. And it's really, uh, it's really takes away from the integrity of the ski here. So stick with the round blade. It's gonna make your life a lot easier. And eventually as you get more skilled, you can play around with the square blade and do some other cool stuff with that. So. All right, so details of uh, removing the sidewall material and shaping the ski. So I want to talk about this and then we'll actually get here to the bench and, and do this process. So in the tips and tails, as I mentioned, they don't really spend much time pulling back that sidewall material and just leave it up to you. It's your job to make sure that your skis are set up properly. So we're going to do that tonight. So we're going to remove that sidewall material like we talked about. And then in the first eight or 12 inches, we're going to do something called shaping and the shaping is going to build a five to seven degree taper into that part of the ski so your file can actually cut. Unfortunately, where, where the ski gets a little bit more delicate and thin in those areas, my sidewall tool, it just has a, a difficult time getting into that area and being really effective when I'm trying to pull that sidewall material back. So what I'll do spend a little bit extra time in that spot with a file just kind of building the taper in by hand. So the first thing I want to do is set up my tool like I mentioned. So what we're going to do is bounce back and forth. I just want to make sure you can all see this. So I'm going to take my sidewall planer and there's a lot of different sidewall planers on the market. Swick sells a couple of different ones. This is our World Cup version. It's a little bit more adjustable and it, it's made out of metal so it could last longer, but all of our sidewall to tools work great. So you can spin this open and that adjusts the blade setting. So I, what I wanna do is set this up on a ski, bring that blade right over the top of the edge as close to the edge as I can without touching the edge and then lock it in place. We also have a height adjustment here, but right now, because the ski's new, I don't really have to play around with that. Also, I'm not sure how well you can see it, but you can see from the factory that taper gets sanded in and it disappears right there. So this is the part of the ski where we're gonna go in by hand and do a little extra work with the file and recess that material. So we have probably a five or seven degree taper built into the sidewall. So it works in two ways, right? It helps you set the side edge angle and you get the proper angle for skiing 
But also this material is going to be back and recessed and out of the way. So when your ski's on edge, it knifes and turns through the snow and holds better without that sidewall material hitting the snow and you losing purchase. So I'm going to put this a little bit more vertical. Hopefully you can see what I'm doing. And I'm going to remove that sidewall material. So this ski is really pretty easy. There's a, a nice hard sidewall material that we're removing. How much do you take off? You want to take off just enough that you can do your work and set the side edge angle. So that's when I'm going to go back with my true bar, put it on the ski, and see that that sidewall material is out of the way, and I can set the right angle here. If you're new to this, work on some skis that you don't care about, some old skis or maybe one of your friend's skis. And we're going to go down the, the full length of the ski here. Removing that material. With thinner skis, you always want to make sure you've got enough room to get past the vices. Okay, so it looks pretty good. This ski has a particular construction where there's a sheet of tightenal right above the edge. And we have to pull that out of the way too because that material cuts at a different rate than the actual edge. So it's going to require me to come in a little closer. And I'll get right over that tightenal sheet. Okay, that's the first step. I'm just going to take, I always keep a little cloth in my pocket to wipe the skis off and get some of that debris out of the way. So now I'm going to take a file. And uh, body file works really good. I'm going to use a 13 tooth file here. And also I'm going to wear two sets of gloves here. And I'm going to build a, a steeper taper into that section. And like I said, it really only has to be up in the tip and the tail of the ski. So I'm going to hold the file in my hand. I'm going to build a bit of a, an angle here. And I'm just going to push that material back out of the way. I'm going to go down to the tail. I'm going to do the same thing. And then I'll just double check it with my true bar to make sure that material is recessed and I can get my file guide in there to set the proper angle. We look pretty good. All right, so we're going to move on to the next step here. And this is really a professional finish on the ski that we're going to talk about. And after shaping the ski, we're going to sand the sidewalls to make them nice and smooth. So when they're on edge, you can glide through the snow a little bit better. And it has a really nice professional look to it. And it's pretty simple to do. So we're going to take some sandpaper and I'm just gonna wrap it around a plastic scraper so usually I'll work with like a like a hundred and fifty grit sandpaper it seems to do a nice job um, also I should mention some of the sidewall materials a little bit more difficult to work with than this this uh, sidewall material we have here tonight which is a fiberglass so the softer phenol or plastic sidewalls are really gummy and that tool can jump a lot when you're pulling that sidewall out of the way. So if it jumps hard on you and, and it looks really rough and messy, you can always sand it out when you're done. So it's a really simple solution. So I'm just taking my, my scraper, wrapping the sandpaper around it, and I'll move it around. And I'll just put it right on the sidewall. And I'm just going to sand that nice and smooth all the way to the tips and tails. Tie everything together, make it look really professional. And take it right up into the tip. And I just finish on the top sheet. And then we're ready for side edging. So I'm just gonna clean off the ski here. Okay, and that's the basics of removing the sidewall material, shaping the tips and tails, and sanding the skis smooth. Okay, sharpening by hand. So 
When sharpening by hand with a file, it's important to follow a few of these guidelines. So make sure you use a hard clamp or seed clamp when you're using the file. You want to make sure it stays in place and it doesn't move around on you. So let me uh, transition here. I'm going to move some tools over to the table and we can jump right into this. All right, I think I have what I need here. All right, so I like to use a really sturdy um, C-clamp. So a lot of our, well, most of our guides actually have these built right into them. So you can actually take your file and clamp it in place, and it's not going to move around on you at all. So this is, this is for a couple of different reasons. First of all, safety. When you're filing, this makes sure that this thing's not going to move or slip where you cut your hand. So we want to make sure it's secured and in place. A lot of people just like to use a spring clamp like this, but I don't for the simple fact that it's not very precise. So it's really easy to put the spring, the spring clamp on, but it moves. So I could slip, I could cut my hand pretty easy, but also it's going to pull possibly a negative angle, right? So this is my three degree guide and every time I, I pull, I could be getting a two. So I like to make sure that I use a really strong fixation with the file when I'm filing. Um, let's see if I'm missing anything else here. Oh yeah, sure, I want to mention this too. This is really important. You want to make sure that you're using a file that is basically the same size as the guide itself. So why is that? If I'm filing a ski that has a lot of shape to it, especially a slalom ski, if I'm using a long file, it's going to hang up from point to point. It might only be cutting here or here. If I have a smaller file, it's going to follow the geometry of the ski a lot better, and I'm going to have better finish. So a lot of times the files are sold this size, so what you have to do is break it or you can buy them in smaller pieces too. So we make files that are a little smaller as well. So you can use this file, you don't have to break it. Uh, you can clamp it right into your, into your guide and you're good to go. But if you do buy one of our files that are a little bit bigger, all you need to do is put it on your table, kind of find where you want to break it, usually halfway, and just give it a quick snap. And then, you're, then you've got two files that you can use, and you're going to have a little bit more precision as you're working with your ski. If I can get this out of here. Okay. All right. So in a clean, organized manner, lay out the tools for the job. So as we talked about before, we're going to need a sidewall planer. So we've got that. File brush. Really important that we're using this. We gotta make sure that our file is clean. It's gonna last longer. So a lot of people um, buy one file to get through the year. It's just not good enough. The files, if you take care of them, they're gonna last longer if you keep the fins nice and clean. But files, you'll probably get 15, uh, probably 25 to 30 tunes out of a file. So think about how much you're skiing, how much you're tuning. It'll help you buy the right amount of supplies here. Okay, so we got our file brush. I like to use a medium race file, um, 13 tooth per centimeter. Uh, it's a little bit more on the aggressive side, but it does a really nice job of cutting and they last longer. And then when I'm done, we're gonna go through a progression of diamond stones and clean anything, everything up anyways. So it works well for me and I recommend it. So we'll have our race file. We wanna go through a stone progression after we file the ski. So I have a 200, a 400 and a 600 diamond stone. The diamond stones are basically miniature files. So it's gonna help you clean everything up as we go. And we'll go pretty deep into this process here. Uh, finally, we're gonna need a ceramic stone, which I talked about earlier. This is the stone that has no abrasive quality. This is the only stone that I use on the base edge. 
because I know when I use this on the base edge, I'm not going to be adding bevel. So this one works really well on the base edge and I can feel confident using it. And then also adjusting the sharpness of the ski when we're done. It's helpful to have a little gummy stone. Okay, as we talked about, we want to make sure we remove that excess sidewall material. If it's your third or fourth time in uh, sharpening, that's when you want to make sure you do it again. Okay, this is the point in the clinic where I like to talk about whether or not you need to file. A lot of people overfile their skis. They're filing every time they're in the ski room and it's not always necessary. So what you want to do is, what I do is I use a, a plastic scraper and I just check the sharpness. So I'll take my plastic scraper, walk it over to the ski, and if it's pulling scraper off with ease, the full length of the ski, they're still pretty sharp. And I don't really need to go through a sharpening with a file. I could jump right to my diamond stones, which will go through the progression here. Um, also, before we start sharpening, we want to just take our 200 diamond stone, was the most aggressive that we're going to be working with here tonight. We want to prep the edge before we actually sharpen. So if you had been out skiing and you hit a rock, it creates heat, which case hardens the edge. And the file won't cut through that very easy. So you have to kind of do an initial prep on the edge to make it so it's easier to file. So we're going to take our diamond stone and clean up the edge first. But before we do that, as we always do, we're going to take our ceramic stone and just run around the edges of the guide. Make sure it's nice and clean so we don't have any surprise scratch on the base when we're done. So I'm going to take this. I know the sidewall material has been pulled back and out of the way. I'm just going to take this diamond stone. I'm going to run it up and down the edge until I hear it pull nice and smooth. And then I know that this, this edge is prepped for sharpening with the file. Okay, using the medium race file with a clamp, uh, you want to start in the tip or tail, it doesn't matter. We're going we're gonna to be sharpening from both, both sides. Like, as I mentioned, we're going to go through and clean everything up with the, um, with the diamond stones after we file. But you want to make sure that you pull as much material off the tip as you do in the waist and the tail. Um, it's really important that you remove a consistent amount of material. So failure to do that, you're going to change the radius of your skis. And I've seen this. Uh, some, of the, some of the fist legal skis, like for instance, this, this ski right here from, from head, I, it might be really close to 30 meter. I'm not sure I'd have to measure it to know for sure. But if I'm not removing the, uh, the same amount of material over the whole ski here, if I leave extra in the tip, extra in the tail, and I remove a lot of the material underfoot, which is pretty common. I see this a lot. This ski could go from being 30 meter to 28 meter like that. So it's technically speaking not legal. So it's just something to consider. And the name of the game here is going down the hill as fast as you can, right? So you're adding turn radius to your skis and you're not going downhill the way that the skis were designed to be used. All right, so talk about filing. Traditional filing literally rips the edge apart. So we're using a file to pull the metal off the edge, ripping it off the ski. So it's going to sharpen the ski, but there's going to be a pretty good burr that hangs off the ski that needs to be cleaned up. So the reason why you want to remove that burr and have a nice clean edge is for two different reasons, performance and safety. So the burr will feel really sharp and edgy, but when it rolls over, when you're out skiing, the skis will actually become less responsive. It feels really good in the ski room, and maybe the first couple turns feel good, but actually it's like less, you're gonna get less performance out of the edge like that. So what we're gonna do is work with the ceramic stone on the base edge to push the burr up, and then we're gonna create a smaller burr by going through our progression of diamond stones. It's gonna be a play between creating a burr, knocking the burr up, creating a smaller burr, knocking the burr up again, and so on, until we get a nice, clean, smooth, safe, performing edge. Uh, I, I have this slide up here because I want to show you the basic idea of the angle that I'm actually pushing the burr up. 
on the base edge. So you can see here I, I have a nickel or a dime slid underneath the, uh, the, the stone itself. That's kind of the angle that I'm holding that ceramic stone at at the base edge. So if I just, as a rule of thumb, go about halfway down the ski, imagine sliding a nickel underneath there. That's the angle that I want to hold this ceramic stone that has no abrasive quality. That's how I want to push that burr back up. So I'm actually pushing with moderate pressure after we file. So I'm going to jump right into filing here. All right, so I've got my race file, my clean guide. It's clamped in place. I'm going to start all the way up the tip. The sidewall material is removed. I'm going to start right up here. I'm going to work in like 10 or 12 inch sections. If I pull five pulls in this section, the next section is going to be the same size, and I'm going to do five pulls. And just keep moving right on down the ski. Okay, so I'm going to take my shop towel, clean off that edge, and then I, I always double check my angle. I want to make sure it's correct. So I'll take my three degree guide, my true bar, I'm going to check it in three spots. I'll check the tip, underfoot, and then the tail. So I'll just jump in here, drop it down. I don't see any light underneath my edge. I know I have a three degree. All right. So as I mentioned, skis feel great. They're super edgy, really sharp, but we have that burr hanging off the edge that we had just talked about. So we have to clean that up. So I'm gonna take that ceramic stone, hold it at that angle that we talked about. I'll start at the tail and push that burr up and come back down to the tail. Okay, now the skis don't feel as good. They feel less sharp. So this is where we're going to go through and jump into our diamond stones. 200, 400, 600. We're going to create a smaller, smoother burr. Okay. Now suddenly the skis feel awesome, super sharp. I'm going to keep going. So I like to use three different diamond stones, but I know some people that will go through a progression of eight stones. What, three to me seems pretty fair. I feel like anything beyond that is kind of diminishing returns. But we'll just keep going back and forth in this process. With the, uh, with the diamond stones, I'm pretty comfortable using the spring clamps because there's not a lot of movement or pressure here. I'm letting the guide and the stone do its work. Okay, I'm going to finish on the base edge and then I'm going right to my fine or my 600. I, I have these set up with all different guides so I don't have to jump back and forth. It saves me a lot of time. So as you build your quiver, hold on to your old guides and use them for, for your diamond stone progression. Okay. And I'll do one really nice light pass on the base edge. And now the skis are nice and sharp. And they're nice and smooth. So I can feel it this way, nice and smooth, but they're really sharp still. OK, so as I mentioned, I like to leave the skis generically sharp in the ski room. I want them, I want them pretty sharp. I don't want to make any adjustments to the sharpness here because when I get out on the hill or for the race, I might find it's uh, really icy. I leave them as is. Or if it's like a dry, grippy snow, I might make an adjustment to the sharpness. But we'll get into that in more detail. All right, so that brings us to machine sharpening. And this is a tool for us that's been really successful called the Evo. And the Evo is a, uh, is a machine that will 
sharpen that will hone and polish the edge to sharp rather than the old technique of using the file which as we mentioned literally rips the edges apart. So the Evo uses a self-adjusting disc and it follows the contour of the ski edge. Uh, it only does side edge and that's all you should be working on anyways. So it does anywhere from a zero degree to five degree and it's just indexed right on the back of the Evo. You pick the angle that you want, snap it in place. Very simple to use. Um, you can adjust the aggression of the machine by swapping out the discs. So the Evo comes with a fine disc, but we also have coarse, medium, fine, and extra fine. So, I as mentioned, it comes with the fine. I usually use the medium for really icy conditions. I might use the fine for dry, grippy snow. A lot of times I'll use the extra fine, kind of to replace my diamond stone progression. And the course is for maybe setting up some new skis that you really have to do a lot of work to get the angle set. The coolest feature about the Evo, and this is, pretty unique to the Evo. There's not a lot of machines that do this. It's going to cut or, or hone the edge as it's sweeping up. So a lot of the machines sweep down like that. They don't necessarily leave a burr, but they leave a really hot edge that's going to require some adjustment. The Evo is going to spin up the edge, so it's not going to do that. And you can, you can really sharpen right off this machine and go ski. So it saves a lot of time. Okay, so the way it's working is, as I mentioned, this, this disc is going to float along the edge. So there's no difficult setup. Very easy to use. And this disc is going to be spinning at about 10,500 RPMs. So it's going to polish that edge to sharpness. Um, the results of really smooth, sharp edge, that's slightly hardened. So the hardening is going to make it so your edges stay sharper longer while you're skiing. And of course, as I mentioned, the disc is sweeping up. So it saves you a lot of time and clean up when you're done. Okay, getting started with the Evo, we're actually going to sharpen the ski with it. Um, you're going to want to wear some respiratory protection. As we're sharpening with the Evo, it does create a little bit of metal dust. So we're going to follow the PPE guidelines that we've talked about. And uh, just so you can hear me, I'm going to wear this mask here. Um, but it's always good to wear a really high quality respirator in the ski room and make sure that people around you are doing the same. So once again, in a clean, organized manner, we want to set up for tuning and I'm going to kind of make an adjustment here. Okay. So tools for the job. We're going to need a sidewall cutter. We're going to need the sharpening machine and the discs that we're going to use the 200 diamond stone for the edge prep, and the white ceramic stone and gummy for adjustment when we're done. So just by like filing by hand, we're gonna make sure that we clean up that edge. Wanna just run that 200 diamond stone up and down the edge and prep it for sharpening. We wanna remove any excess sidewall material that's in the way. The Evo won't cut through that material. It's just like hand sharpening. You have to remove that sidewall material. If you don't, it's going to really, it could potentially really gum up the disc. If it's a soft sidewall, <clears throat> it could uh, heat up that sidewall material and gum up your disc. And uh, it, it won't cut through that, through that material. Okay, so using the machine to sharpen the edge. So we know that the ski has had the sidewall material removed. It's shaped, it's sanded. I actually know there's a three degree on here, so it should make sharpening really easy. Again, if I got done with a day of skiing, I might just do a touch up on them. I could use that extra fine disc or go through my disc progression. The Evo is directional. We're always going to be using it from the right to the left. So it's going to be right on here with an arrow. And the reason for that is the discs are held in with friction. So if you use it the opposite direction, it could unseat this disc. It's really not a big deal. The disc could fall out. It doesn't do any damage to anything. You just put the disc back in, but we are saying always from the right to the left. 
Um, as I mentioned again, there's no setup. This is going to follow the contour of the edge. This machine's going to do the work for you. You don't have to muscle it or force it. If the sidewall material is removed, it's going to make tuning really easy. So pick the angle that I want. So I want to sharpen for a three degree. If I wanted a two, I could just simply click it in place here at a two degree, but I want a three. And then the machine has a power cord. A lot of people think this is a battery, but it's actually a motor. So we're going to plug it, this in right here and I can turn it on simply with my operating hand. All right. So just like we did with hand filing, we want to make sure that we sharpen as far into the tail and as far into the tip as we can so we maintain that radius. <clears throat> I'm going to start all the way back here. Turn it on. I want to make sure I give myself some space to clear these vices as I go through, just like I did with hand tuning. Let the machine do the work for you. So I'm not going to hold it up top high. I'm not going to push down. I'm really going to turn this machine on and I'm, I'm simply going to push it against the base. I'm going to let the machine do all the work and I'm just going to keep it moving. It's only spinning at 10,500 RPM. So if I stall for a second, it won't burn the edge. Like a lot of machines spin at about 16,000 RPMs and they could damage the edge. But what I'm finding at the, with the Evo, if I move nice and slow, I have a beautiful finish on the edge. Okay, so this key's sharp, and it's at a three degree. So I can see with one pass, I have a nice, beautiful finish. Ski's really nice and sharp. And as I mentioned, that's all I have to do. I don't have to go in and do any cleanup with my diamond stones to clean up a hot edge from, from filing. It swept up the edge. Skis are ready to ski on. So the Evo can really save you a lot of time. It's very consistent. My daughter is a U14 racer. She can sharpen her skis the same way that I sharpen her skis. Super consistent. Okay, the Evo will last a really long time and it will perform really well. You just have to make sure you keep it clean. And it's pretty simple. So all we're gonna be doing is opening up this chamber when we're done using the Evo. We'll take the disc out, and I don't have one with me right now, but we just take a little paintbrush and kind of spin around the chamber, make sure it's nice and clean. You can hit it with a little bit of compressed air. I know they make the little compressed air for the keyboards that you can just strike uh, the chamber there and clean it out. And then what we want to do is make sure that we keep this shaft lubricated. That's the key to making sure the operation is really smooth. So we take a little bit of bike lube, drip it right on the shaft, cycle it through a couple of times, and you're good to go. So my machine, I've got about 3,000 tunings on it. And if, if I'm just staying on top of it and keeping it clean, probably every 15 or 20 pairs of skis, it, it, it'll serve you well for a long time. Price per tune is really reasonable with the Evo compared to um, tuning supplies overall. All right, so at this point, we're ready for waxing. We sharpened all of our edges, uh, touched up the skis. They're generically sharp. You can do your wax work. Next week, we're going to get really, really deep in the waxing. So we're going to go over all those techniques and details next Thursday. All right, so I mentioned this earlier, adjusting the sharpness for dry, grippy snow or ice. So we're going to be leaving the skis nice and sharp. We're going to go out. To the, to the hill, the race hill, and we're gonna check it out. So if it's really icy, like I said, just leave them sharp, it's that simple. You don't have to do too much work for dialing in the, the sharpness of the skis if it's really icy. The trick with GS and slalom skis is dry grippy snow and adjusting the edge sharpness. So how do you do it? Well, 
You could take a guess, but I'd highly recommend that you just take a run on the skis. Find a pitch that's really similar to the race hill itself and get a feel for them. You can never get that first run back and if you're surprised by too sharp of ski and dry grippy snow. So it's really simple. Everybody should have this in their pocket, a gummy stone. You can put it in your pocket, you can ski around with it, it's not going to hurt you if you fall down. Very simple. So you can take a run, get a feel for the skis if they feel too grippy. If you can't stiv it or slide or articulate the ski because it's hooking up too hard, all you need to do is stop on the hill, put the rubber bands on your, on your brakes, pull out your gummy, and we're going to make a couple of full length passes. But a little trick that I like to do is I like to set the ski up with a little different uh, sharpness in the tips and tails. So when I talk about stivet or a slide, I want the ability to articulate the ski, stivet, slide, and stand on it, right? If the ski is consistently sharp the whole way, it's a little bit more difficult. So my trick is using that gummy stone to progressively make the ski less sharp to the tail, and I'll pull a little bit of the hum off the tip too but I like to leave this part of the ski pretty sharp. This is kind of the power zone or power slot. You're gonna get a lot of energy and snap out of the ski in this area. So don't go too crazy, pulling back the sharpness there. So I take my gummy stone and I'm gonna start at the tail here. So I'm gonna work in about 10 inch sections and I'm gonna start at the tail, and go 10, 10 inches and stop. And I'll go 20 inches. I'm gonna keep going with that until I get right behind the heel of the boot. I'll stop right there. So now the ski's progressively less sharp to the tail. I can break it loose. I'm going to make one full length pass all the way up to the tip. And I'm just going to pull a little bit of the tip sharpness back. So I'll work in smaller sections. And this is going to make the edge a little bit more predictable. And at this point, jump back on the skis, get a feel for them, see if there still needs some more gummy stone work. Okay, so that's edge tuning. Uh, we're going to answer some questions here before we wrap it up for the night. If you have any other questions, you can contact us by email too. And uh, so next week, we're going to go into some waxing details. We're going to take it really detailed. We're going to go through a little bit of a review from the first clinic. And we're going to go through all the systems of Swix waxes, when and how to use them. Uh, we'll go through the floral free system, how to use it wax selection criteria, proper use of waxing tools, prepping your iron, general iron care, wax hardness and iron temp, proper wax application, waxing and scraping techniques, brush selection, and proper brushing techniques. So make sure that you're around next week. It'll be a great clinic. So if you have any questions, um, put them on the chat line and Pete will let me know and I'll see if I can answer them for you. Would a speed ski have a higher bevel, slalom closer to half degree and one degree for uh, Super G? Yeah, that's a great question. Will a speed ski have more base bevel? And the answer is yes. So generally speaking, the slalom skis, technical skis, slalom ski and GS will be anywhere from like a half degree to 0.75, depending on what you like. Speed skis, Super G and, and downhill skis will be 0.75 to one degree, usually. I don't like to go much past one degree because there's a point at which the skis will drive downhill, but they lose a lot of their snap and power. So you have a hard time generating power out of the turn. So something to consider. Do you have any recommendations for a good bevel reading tool? Do I have any recommendations for a good bevel reading tool? Uh, well, I would say, uh, the side cut tool that I showed that's digital is really cool. And I would say buy a true bar too. So if you buy that tool, use it, develop an eye for that angle, and make sure you check it by hand with your true bar afterwards so you can kind of build an, a, a, a visual, um, your mind's eye of what the angle should look like. Uh, it's expensive. That tool is probably close to $300. Um, and there, there's some other ones on the market, but I'm sure you can just find them online. For junior multi-event skis, what is a recommended base bevel? For junior multi-event skis, what's the recommended base bevel? 
going back to that that graph I showed at the very beginning with the all the different terrain flat steep I would say pick 0 0.75 0 0.75 is it's not as reactive as half degree it's not as uh, as loose as one degree it's kind of a do everything angle so I would say start with 0.75 but if you're not sure you could always start with less and add more any comment on how snow conditions would affect the base edges and or side? Any comment on how snow conditions will affect the base edge or side edge angle? Yeah. So uh, let's say it's really icy. If it's really aggressive icy conditions, your edge is going to become dull faster. So in extreme conditions, uh, if you're using a four degree, for instance, for slalom, you might find that you only get a couple of runs before that edge rolls over. A lot of times if you're running like a really aggressive angle, like a four degree for slalom skis, you're probably going to need a couple pairs of skis on the, on the hill to make sure the ski is performing properly. If it's dry grippy snow, the angle won't be affected as much. So you could go out skiing one day in dry grippy snow, get back to the ski room, take four runs and find, oh, my skis are pretty, they're pretty sharp still. I don't need to sharpen them. But you could go out in icy conditions, take the same amount of runs, and find that you need to sharpen. What base bevel are FIS and World Cup racers generally using for slalom, GS, Super G, and downhill? What base bevel are FIS and World Cup skiers using for slalom, GS, Super G, and downhill? Uh, at the highest levels, it gets really technical, and you could take it pretty deep, but it's highly personal. So I know some speed racers that use a degree and a half of base bevel. I know some that use 0.75. A lot of this is going to depend on how you stand in your boots, the actual skis that you're using. There's a lot of work and testing that goes into finding the best combination for what works for you specifically as an athlete. So it's not a real cut and dry answer, but I would say in general, it's half degree for slalom, maybe even less. Uh, GS skis would be about half degree to 0.75. Super G skis 0.75 to one, and downhill skis are like probably one to one and a half maximum. When you were filing the base, you started and ended with a repetitive motion. Do you need more filing at the tip and tail? That's a good question. Do you need more filing setting base bevel in the tip and tail? Yeah, when I went into those sections, I gave it a little extra because it's a harder spot to uh, get the file in and, and hold it. It's, uh, the tips and tails are tricky, whether or not you're setting base bevel or you're setting side edge bevel. You have to be a little bit more careful. Um, so I was giving it a little extra. and. Uh, that being said, too, sometimes it's nice to add a little bit of extra bevel in the tips and tails because it helps the ski kind of roll smoothly in and out of the turn. Any comments on the Swix Phantom Roller Adjustable Sidewall Side Edge File Beveler? Any comments on the Swix Phantom Side Edge Beveler? That's a great tool. You know, we have a lot of different tools out there. It just depends specifically on what you're looking for. Uh, so I was talking about our uh, sidewall puller. This is the World Cup version. We have another version that's a, a less expensive, uh, more recreational tool. It's made out of plastic. It really works well. It just depends on what you're looking for. Like I'll use that lesser expensive tool quite often. I like how it feels in my hand. It's made out of plastic but it still works great. This tool offers a little bit more adjustability, a little bit more precision. It's the same with our side edge guides too. So we have a lot of different versions. Uh, I brought this one out just to show it. The one I was using during my clinic is our World Cup version. This one right here is made out of stainless steel. It's really solid. You can feel the weight and quality of it. This tool right here will probably never wear out. It will last a really long time, and I know it's very precise. So we have a lesser expensive version, and it's a really nice tool as well. It still has the clamp built into it, but this one's made out of hardened aluminum. So this still has a stainless steel faceplate on it, so it, it's still pretty durable. 
we have another price point that's just hardened aluminum. They won't last as long. The, the Phantom and some of the other tools that we have for side edge uh, that you're talking about um, are, could be made out of plastic. They could have rollers. There's a lot of different ones out there. Um, they, they work great. They'll set a nice angle, but like, how long do you want to have it for? Is it something that you want almost like an heirloom tool like this that's going to last forever and always have it? We just have price points for basically everybody. Do you ever diamond stone the base edge? Do I ever diamond stone the base edge? No, I don't. And so this was interesting. I used to have my own ski racing store in Stowe, Vermont, and I would set the base bevel for some customers. Um, they happened to be masters racers, and they really enjoyed working on their skis. So they would go back home after I set up all the angles and everything was all set, and they would want to really polish that base edge and make it super smooth. So they would use uh, diamond stone. It's a miniature file, right? So they put it into the guide, and they would push and use it over and over and over. And man, they made the edges super smooth. But when they brought the skis back to me and I put my true bar on, I was shocked to see how much bevel was on the base edge. So any of these, for me, I don't touch the base edge with it. The only stone that I touch on the base edge is this little ceramic that doesn't have any abrasive quality. Do you lubricate the diamond stones? Thoughts on yeah, do, do I lubricate the diamond stones? It's a great idea, and they'll actually cut a little bit better, but it's, it's a little messy. So I could uh, be working on my skis and uh, lubricating and going back and forth, and it really kind of does make a mess. The sidewalls kind of get all dirty, and uh, these diamond stones will last a little longer if you keep them clean with water, um, but generally speaking for me, I, I don't go through the process because it's a little bit messy. Do you need to use a sidewall cutter before the Evo? Do you need to use the sidewall cutter before the Evo? Yes. Same as sharpening by hand. You're going to want to remove the sidewall material initially. You can use the Evo. Probably every fourth time that you sharpen with the Evo, you're going to want to use that sidewall cutter again to make sure the sidewall material is out of the way. Is a Panzer file and a larger angle guide acceptable for removing sidewall, or is that no longer okay? Uh, is a Panzer file and a larger angle side edge guide good for sidewall removal? Yeah, you can do that for sure. So if you had a seven degree or five degree and a Panzer file to go into this area where for me, I've done a ton of skis. I, I can hold on, I can use my hand as the guide and kind of build that taper in. But you could use an aggressive file and an aggressive guide to do the same thing. Is there a need to knock down burrs after using the Evo? Is there a need to knock down burrs after using the Evo? The Evo isn't creating any burrs, so we don't have to go back and do that at all. We've got a really cool video online. If you type in uh, Evo Edger, um, there's two videos. There's one for cleaning and there's one for how to use the Evo. Um, basically what I showed you tonight, but it's two videos with me that you can check out if you want more detail with it. Uh, no, you don't have to do that. You can ski on it right off the discs, which is great. But I do recommend using the Diamond Stone to prep the edge before you use the Evo so there isn't any... The Evo is going to cut um, hardened material, no problem. But if there's a big burr and my disc hits that burr, it could damage my disc. So I just like to clean that edge just to make sure my discs don't get damaged and they last longer. What are World Cup techs using? Hand filing or power sharpeners? What are World Tech techs using? Hand sharpening or power sharpening? It just depends on who the person is. Uh, the, the edgers that I showed you tonight, like the Evo, they're super consistent. I would say usually in GS or Slalom, that's where you're finding that the machines are being used, sometimes in Super G. It depends on how aggressive the skier is. Um, a lot of guys or technicians will use hand filing for speed events because they might want a ski that's a little less sharp or, or, or not as honed as um, by, the, by the machine. But, but for me, I, I pretty much use the machine all the time. I hardly ever file by hand anymore. How often should I hand file? How often should I hand file? 
You should check the sharpness of your skis after you ski. If they're sharp, make sure you hand file. If they're, I mean, I'm sorry, if they're sharp, all you have to do is go through your diamond stones. If they're dull, go through the sharpening progression. Will you go over paste wax versus hot wax? When we go through the waxing, uh, we're going to do two different sessions, really. So next week, we're going to go really deep into using the system and ironing and waxes using paraffins, block waxes. The last clinic that we're going to do, we're going to do one on Thursday next week, and then the following and last one, the fourth series, is going to be on Friday, so this is the day after. That one's going to be pretty fun. I'm pretty excited about it, and that's more of like race day setup. So that's when we're going to get into applying liquids, applying blocks, and applying powders. So we'll talk more about that on the fourth clinic on next Friday. Um, so yeah, we'll cover it, but you have to do both the clinics. Uh, okay, we got a we got an interesting one here. Uh, this may be outside the scope of what you do. Um, do you have any thought about working with? magnet traction edges on snowboards so i used to own a ski service shop in still vermont and we did a lot of boards for the um, national team snowboard team and some of the boards that came through had magnet traction and they were really really hard to work on and i don't think they're really designed to be sharpened that very often because the aggression is kind of built into the shape so you know, I talked about using a smaller file to, to kind of follow the contour of the edge. The magnet traction has got a lot of contour. So I, I broke a file. It was, it was about that big. So I could, I could file the edge and follow the contour. It was really difficult. And, uh, but I think it worked. So I, I do have some experience with the magnet traction. What bevels do you recommend for free ride skis? What bevels do I recommend for free ride skis? So it'd be free ride and snowboard. And usually the, the bevels are just less aggressive. So on the base edge, it'd be 0.75 to one degree, maybe a little bit more. The side edge bevels, from what I've seen for like snowboard cross or park and pipe guys, like one to two degree on the side, depending on how aggressive you like your skis and how often you're tuning. Pros and cons of chromed versus non-chromed files. Pros and cons of chromed versus non-chromed files. Chrome files last longer. They've been chromed. There's a hardening process to that. So they're going to be more expensive. They'll last longer. They're usually a little bit more precise too. So the higher quality files, when you, uh, when you have, spend the money on a, on a higher quality file, what are you buying? You're buying precision. So you're buying a file, when I look down it, is straight. You're buying a file that's harder. It's going to last longer. If I buy a less expensive file, it won't have the uh, finishing that the more expensive files have, so they won't last as long. And there's a good chance when I look down it, it's not straight or not as straight. So you buy strength and quality with the Chrome file. I've always wet my diamond or my stones. Is this wrong? Evo is always dry, question mark. I've always wet my diamond stones. Yes, you can definitely do that. I don't because it makes the sidewalls really messy. And uh, one thing I'll say about the diamond stones is they just they don't last super long. Uh, most of the time, people use these way too long. And I would say just look at them. If you're keeping them wet, they'll last a little bit longer. Where I was going with that is I don't buy these all the time. I, I work for Swix, so I'm not I'm not buying them like you guys do. But, but it will last a little bit longer if you put some water on there. But look closely. You know, this, it's, an, uh, it's, a, it's like sandpaper. It's an aggressive finish. So if you're unsure if, it, if it's still good, just look at it and see if you can still see that aggressive finish. If you can't, it's time to replace them. What are recommended base and side bevels for an all-mountain ski for an advanced skier? What are recommended recreational bevels for a strong skier? Uh, it depends on what kind of skiing you like to do. If, you're, uh, if you have a recreational ski and you like to ski on piste, you're on groomers most of the time, I'd say you could probably run a more aggressive setup. It might be more fun, right? So you could do 0.75 or a two degree on the side edge. Depends on how much you're tuning and how much you ski too. 
if I'm skiing in the woods and I like to ski off piece, but I have like a performance ski, I'll want something that I can slide and stiv it. I'll set it up less aggressively, maybe a one degree on the base, uh, one to two on the side. Also regionally it depends. So like you could live in the east here, we have we have a lot of ice. So I want something that's gonna hold and really perform in ice. When I lived in Utah, I liked something that was like less aggressive. So I used a one and a one. So it just really depends on where you are too. Do wider edges, like two and a half millimeters, influence tuning? Do wider edges influence tuning, yes. Yeah, so setting the base bevel with wider edges is gonna be more difficult. There's more material to remove. It's a lot more difficult. If the edges are really thin, you have to be careful too because you don't wanna to remove too much material. So when the edges get really thin, as I was setting that base bevel, I made four full length poles. If the edges are really thin, I might only do one or two, depending, because there's not as much material to get recessed and out of the way. Plus the skis become less aggressive when the skis edge is thinner. So a lot of speed skis, I know technicians will set the ski up, they'll, they'll file them and take a lot of life out of the ski because they don't want the ski to be overly aggressive on edge. What do you recommend for keeping the edge consistent when the waists are duller than the tips and tails after a day of skiing? What do I recommend for keeping, can you read it again for me? What do you recommend for keeping the edge consistent when the waists are duller than the tips and tails after a day of skiing? Okay. How do you keep the edge angle consistent if the, if the waist is less sharp than the tips and tails after a day of skiing? That's where I go into my, my, my check. I'm going to take my scraper and just check that edge angle, see if it's still sharp. If it's dull underfoot, but it's sharp in the tips and tails, for me, I'm going to go in and sharpen the ski. If I find an area that's not sharp, I'm going to sharpen it. Um, if the overall ski is pretty sharp, I can just go through my diamond stones. How can you get a 0.2 degree base bevel? Is there a guide less than 0.5 degree? So how do you get a 0.2 degree base bevel? Is there a guide less than a 0.5 degree? So I would take that guide that I used and I would only do two poles and it would be really light. I wouldn't do four poles. I just kind of, like I said, <clears throat> you chip away at it until you find where you want to be. I've, 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 I had my, I've been doing race service for over 20 years. I had a, I had a shop and we tuned 8,000 pairs of race skis a year. I have a ton of experience setting base bevel and I, I know using my tools exactly what I need to do. And usually that moderate pressure, two full length poles would get you to a quarter degree. What's the best way to fix base edge nicks from stone hits? What's the be best way to fix base edge nicks from stone hits? Okay, so a really good question. And this is where I go to that ceramic stone. So I'm always going to be working on the base edge if there's some damage, just like it would be for sharpening. And uh, like I said, I stay away from the diamond stone on the base edge. Let's say it's horrible damage. Okay, I'm, I might use the, 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 the diamond stone in that situation, but I only will use it in that one spot. So I'll go in there and try to smooth it out as much as I can. And then I'm going to finish off with that ceramic. Okay, so my ski, when I'm done, it might be nice and sharp. It might only be dull in that like one little one centimeter area. Big deal. The skis will still perform great. Now, if I have a lot of areas like that, that's when I have to make sure I take it to a shop to have the ski stone ground, reset that base bevel. How to prep sidewall on a cap ski. How to prep a sidewall on the cap ski. It's really pretty simple. I'll just show you over here real quick. So the cap ski is going to have the shape built right into it. So we talked tonight about a vertical or I guess you couldn't call it a World Cup or torsion box construction ski. The layers are, are built right into it here and it's vertical so we're gonna have to do some shaping. The cap ski itself has that shape built right into it. And a lot of the integrity of the ski is actually in that shape. But you can see here, the edges might be like that. So really there's nothing to recess and pull out of the way. There's no shaping required, generally speaking. 
but usually right above the edge there's a little piece of plastic and so that's where I'm going to use that round blade and I only really have to focus on that one little area and that's it you don't have to the, the cap skis save you a lot of time and work what is the best way to keep rust off the edges in the off season <clears throat> What is the best way to keep rust off the edges in the off season? You got to find a dry place to keep your skis. Uh, it's really important. Like you need to find the driest, uh, moderately warm place. Like if you put your skis in the basement, there's a pretty good chance that they're going to end up with rust on them. If you live in the east, it's really hard not to have rusty edges. If you live in Utah, maybe it's not big of a deal. But uh, I would say like <clears throat> if you had some space in your garage like if you could put them high in your garage where it's nice and dry it's probably the best place to do it my file often skips and doesn't bite any recommendations my file often skips and doesn't bite any recommendations buy a new file uh, remove that sidewall material that might be part of it prep the edge beforehand with the uh, diamond stone to make sure there isn't a case of hardening there that would make your file skip. Um, make sure you clamp your file in place with a nice strong clamp, and that should do it. If, if that doesn't work, you, d you do need to buy a new file. Can you use both the file and the Evo? Because I see my coach first file manually and then with the <clears> machine. Can you use the file first and then the Evo? Yeah, of course you can. It, you're just taking more material off the ski. Um, some of the machines, uh, most of the machines, I should say, have a really hard time getting in to the tips and tails. What's cool about the Evo is it's so small, I can get right into those areas with ease. So I can make sure I maintain the turn radius of the ski. If you don't do that with some of the machines, you're going to turn the, you're going to change the turn radius. So if you're using I don't know any of the any of the other machines. There's only a couple of them I know of that get right into the tips and tails like the Evo. But there was a racer years ago I was working with, and we went to World Juniors, and he had been using a machine, and he was sharpening them himself, and they was doing a good job. At World Juniors, they'll actually check to see what the turn radius is. They'll check right when the race is done. So it's important as a technician that you that you check this out. And we're going to go over all this detail. In the last clinic next Friday, we're going to show you how to measure your turn radius, track all this information on your skis, build that picture that we talked about. So what ended up happening was his machine wouldn't get into these areas, which requires you to go through and hand tune those areas to maintain the, the, the turn radius. So when I went through and did the check at the time, 35 meter was the standard for GS. When I measured his skis, they were 32 meter because he hadn't been tuning this area, which you can do really easy with the Evo. So it required me to go in here and do extra work by hand and whittle these down. I actually used the Evo. I did 60 passes with the Evo on in each of these sections to get the ski back to 35 meter. So it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, someone someone asked for a disaster story in tuning on the uh, your World Cup experience, so we'll count that one as uh, <laughs> as the disaster story. I've got a good one actually, my disaster story with tuning from my World Cup days, and this goes back to the last thing we talked about. My disaster story was dry, grippy snow. So, I was at uh, working with a tech or a skier uh, before there was a World Cups in Park City, and it was a warm up race in Colorado at Winter Park super dry grippy snow and the athlete I worked with I had the skis too sharp it was slalom she told me after the race and uh, I talked to the head coach about it and he said oh she's crazy the skis were fine okay so I, en I ended up staying with this guy I was rooming with him and I, I after working on the skis all day long in the ski room I went to, back to my room he was on the phone with the head guy from the US ski team and I heard him say Graham made the skis too sharp so I thought to myself, I never want to have that happen again. And that's when I started asking her to take a warm-up on the skis. I follow her around. I find that pitch that was similar to the race hill, 
and she gave me feedback. These skis are too sharp or not sharp enough. It was never sh not sharp enough. They're just too sharp. So I'd make adjustments on the hill, and I never once had another problem with ski sharpness, and it was great. So that's my disaster story, but it, it's helpful. You can't ever get that first run back, so make sure you ski on your skis to get a feel for it. You can always freshen up your wax before your race run. How to sharpen serrated snowboard edges? How to sharpen serrated snowboard edges? I'm not sure what that is. Maybe the serration is the uh, finish from the disc. And when you look closely at the finish from disc sharpening, it looks a little serrated, but it's really a, a really highly polished finish. Um, but if that is like that, if you're going to sharpen by hand, it's uh, the same process as you would normally. Does the Evo take off less material than hand filing? Does the Evo take off less material than hand filing? In general, yes. Uh, if you're not using the, the more aggressive coarse stone, for sure. The, uh, it, it'll take less material off. Is it okay to tune my skis in the apartment if you don't have a garage or something similar? Is it okay to tune your skis in an apartment? Yeah, I would say so. I would just make sure that you put down a tarp um, so that you can clean up, make clean up a little bit easier. And uh, yeah, I would say like try to try to maybe put something up around you so you can keep the dust contained. Uh, but I would say like there's n no real reason why you can't do it. How to clean Evo discs. How to clean Evo discs. This is the great thing. You don't have to. So they, they, they stay clean. As long as you're removing that sidewall material, the discs are going to stay nice and clean. Does it matter which direction you sharpen your edges? I saw you go one direction on one side and another on the other side. Does it matter which direction you sharpen your edges? No, not really, because we're going to go through that diamond stone progression afterwards, and it kind of ties everything together. So you can pull always from tip to tail, but it requires you to be able to pull with your right hand and your left hand. So if I'm going to pull from the tip on this side, I have to do it right-handed. If I want to pull from the tip on the other side, I have to do it left-handed. So you can do it, but it's, it's not easy to be able to do it like that. How long do the Evo discs last? The Evo discs, how long do they last? You're going to get about 75 to 100 tunes out of one of the discs. So they really hold up quite well. Most people would have a disc for a season. All right. Well, it sounds like that's all the questions, but thanks for joining us tonight. Make sure you're here next week. Waxing, detail, and then that last one, it, it, it's going to be a really cool clinic. So hopefully you're around for that too. So thanks a lot.